Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Kindly support me through my Patreon so that I can keep making such videos. Start of part one, the people of the book. Start of chapter one, our first customers. Kuntum khaira ummati, ye are the best of peoples. Ukhrijat linnas, evolved for mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof, enjoy what is right. وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And forbidding what is wrong. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And believing in Allah. وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ If only the people of the book had faith. لَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهُمْ It were best for them. مِنْ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Among them are some who have faith. But most of them are perverted transgressors. Holy Quran, Surah Ali Imran, Chapter 3, Verse 110. Leave them alone? The above ayah is one of the most versatile verses of the Holy Quran. I have heard dozens of lectures from our learned brethren reciting the first half of the ayah, stopping at the word Allah, followed by different dissertations. Indeed, I have done the same with the exposition of over half a dozen different topics. During the question and answer session at the end of my lectures in Newcastle, I was asked as to my reasons for not leaving the Jews and the Christians alone in my discourses and writings. In answer to this question, I read the first half of the above verse and asked my audience to indicate the number of people who were familiar with the quotation. In the audience of about 300, 11 brothers put up their hands. I then requested, if any of the 11 were Hafizul Qur'an, they should put their hands down since they were expected to know the whole verse by virtue of their memorization of the Holy Qur'an. Three out of the eleven put down their hands. I asked the remaining eight individually to complete the second half of the verse. There was a hundred percent failure. I too had been in the same boat with regard to the memorizing of this ayah for a very long time. In my experience, I have not yet heard an exposition of the second half of this verse, and have also noted that none of the commentators of the Holy Qur'an have anything to say on it. It is as if there is some kind of conspiracy on their part, but there is no conspiracy. The first half of the ayah is so versatile and adaptable that every expositor delivers his message on the righteous behavior and admonitions against straying from the path based on this half of the verse. They appear to be content to conclude their comments on this half of the verse and bask in the satisfaction of a job well done. The answer to the question, why pick on the Jews and the Christians, is to be found in the second half of the Quranic quotation above, paraphrased. But if only the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearkened unto this message, the message of the Holy Qur'an, it will be better for them. In other words, it will also be better for you, O Muslims. Among them, that is Jews and Christians, are some who are a goodly people, but the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Holy Qur'an, Surah Ali Imran, Chapter 3, Verse 110 At the very outset, in the verse introducing this treatise, Allah confers upon the Ummah the honor, privilege, and high status of being the best people evolved for mankind. 
that is, evolved for the good of mankind. This high honor and status imposes upon us the duty and responsibility of selflessly sharing this noble status with the rest of mankind. It is the Ahle Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, with whom we should begin with since they have already been prepared for this message. After all, numerous prophets have proclaimed the message to them. They do not deny possession of a scripture and boast the revelation of the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil by their respective prophets. Accordingly, they are the fittest and best prepared of people to accept the latest dispensation of Islam. They should have been the foremost in submitting their will to the will of Allah in Islam, a renewal and a confirmation of the revelation already with them. Yet they have been the first to reject it. And why the rejection? What are their considerations? Nevertheless, theirs is not a totally lost case. Allah assures us that among the Jews and the Christians are some who are sincere, but the majority of them are perverted transgressors. To the good Christian we must apply the best methods of getting our message true to both the goodly person as well as the rebellious, arrogant person. To the goodly among them open the Holy Qur'an and bring to light these verses of chapter 3, beginning with verse 42. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Allah hath chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen, which we reveal unto thee, O Prophet, by inspiration. Thou wast not with them when they cast lots with arrows, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary. Nor wast thou with them when they disputed the point. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Allah giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and the hereafter, and of the company of those nearest to Allah. He shall speak to the people in childhood and in maturity, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. She said, O my Lord, how shall I have son when no man hath touched me? He said, Even so, Allah created what he willeth. When he hath decreed a plan, he but saith to it, Be, and it is. And Allah will teach him the book and wisdom, the law and the gospel. And appoint him an apostle to the children of Israel with this message. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, in that I make for you out of clay, as it were, the figure of a bird, and breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by Allah's leave. And I heal those born blind and the lepers, and I quicken the dead by Allah's leave. And I declare to you what ye eat, and what ye store in your houses. Surely therein is a sign for you if ye did believe. Holy Quran, Surah Ali Imran Chapter 3, verses 42 to 49 In your approach to the Christians, work on the assumption that every Christian is a good and sincere Christian, unless they prove otherwise. Read the above Quranic verse, if possible in conjunction with their Arab equivalent, phrase by phrase. You cannot imagine the tremendous impact Allah's words have on the listener. I have seen again and again that tears well up in the eyes of the listener, exactly as recorded in the Noble Qur'an. And when they listen to the revelation received by the Messenger Muhammad, thou wilt see their eyes overflowing with tears, for they recognize the truth. Holy Qur'an, Surah Maida, Chapter 5, Verse 86 This is a positive approach. Treat them all with kindness and compassion they deserve. However, if they demonstrate their animosity and pour out their venom against the Holy Prophet, 
the Holy Quran and Islam, we are entitled to change our approach. We have already been warned against such eventualities in the last phrase of the ayah quoted at the beginning of this chapter. But most of them are perverted transgressors. End of chapter 1 Start of chapter 2 New Christian Strategy After 15 years of strenuous efforts to obtain a visa to visit the Sudan, I received one at last in 1992. I was welcomed by the country and conducted a lecture tour. The purpose of the tour was to arm my Muslim brethren against the Christian missionaries who are trying to gain ascendancy there. At question time at the end of one of my talks in Khartoum, a university student posed the question. Christian crusaders from Britain and America are knocking at our doors in Khartoum. We Muslims welcome them with our traditional Arab hospitality of Ahlan wa Sahlan, loosely translated, means as being part of the family with no formalities. Once settled, these missionaries question us whether we Muslims believe in the Day of Judgment. Our response is, of course. They follow this up with another question. After judgment is established, you will inherit heaven if you deserve it or hell if you have earned it. Do you believe in it? Again, our answer is yes. In a well-planned strategy, this is followed by a third question. This heaven of yours, where will it be located? On earth or in the skies? What does your Quran say? We would like to know from you, sir, as to what the answer is. The dig is in the question. What does your Quran say? If you answer, on earth, he will ask, show me, that is in the Quran. If you had answered, in the skies, he is ready with the same retort. Show me. The enemy is well trained and well armed. He has studied his clients closely. He has discovered that 90% of the Muslims, though they have their preferences either for the earth or the heavens, they will not be able to point to any specific verses in the Holy Quran to support them. This is exactly what he wants you to admit. Once you have admitted your inability to prove your point from the Holy Quran, then he will spring the trap and say, Let me show you what my Bible says. He had given you the first opportunity to expound to him your Quran, and since you had failed, you are now morally obliged to listen to his exposition. Common courtesy demands that you give him a hearing, and we Muslims are courteous people. After pummeling you into helpless submission, he leaves behind a beautiful brochure in glorious technicolor entitled How to Find the Road to Paradise in a language of your choice, like the one reproduced here. The question remains, what is the Quranic answer to the Christian riddle? Will the Muslim heaven be on earth or in the skies? I had to admit to my audience in Khartoum that if the question was put to me, I would have to confess to my Christian adversary that I don't know. I would have to confess that I am ashamed of myself. Until very recently, I did not have the Quranic answer. Having so conceded, we must now turn the tables on the enemy. I would suggest to him that though I do not know my Quran as well as I ought to, I take it that you know your Bible. He would be too arrogant to say, No, he is holding under his arm. He is well equipped. I would request him or her, Can I have a look at your Bible? The missionary would be overwhelmed at this request. You are helping them to fulfill their mission. I open the very first book of the Bible called Genesis. The Roman Catholic Bible has 73 books in it and the Protestant world has 66 in their encyclopedia called the Bible. I hand back the Bible to the Christian, having opened it to Genesis chapter 19 pointing to verse 30 and suggesting that he reads it out aloud to me. He is too clever to do that. 
he is trained not to follow your instructions, but read only the selected ones to push down your throat. He scans the verses. He smells the rat. He or she will want to change the subject. You ask, what's wrong? Is that not the book of God? He says, yes. Then read it. If he reads, what does he read? I gave my audience the gist of these verses and of Genesis chapter 35 verse 22. And still in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 38 verses 15 to 18, with the question to the Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers, what is the moral? What is the moral of these verses, stories? We tell our children anecdotes, fables, the fox and the grapes, the wolf and the lamb, the dog and his shadow, etc. Not just for entertainment, but with a view to imparting morals to them. Behind these stories is a moral. We are teaching our children not to be like the greedy fox, who when it could not reach the bunch of grapes said that the grapes are sour. Do not be like that greedy dog, who when seeing its reflection in the water, lost the bone it had in its mouth for the other dog's bone. There is a moral behind these stories. Now then, what is the moral behind daughters seducing their father, night after night and begetting bastard children through him? Genesis chapter 19 verses 30 to 36. Or of a son having intercourse with his mother. Genesis chapter 35 verse 22. Or of a father-in-law cohabiting with his daughter-in-law and begetting incestuous twins through her. Genesis chapter 38 verses 15 to 18. If there are no moral lessons to be learned from these pornographic narrations in the so-called Book of God, then they are immoral. The audience was no doubt thrilled by the way the tables could be turned against the Christian missionaries. Combat Kit The link to the Combat Kit can be found in the description below. On my return home to South Africa, I wrote an article on how to counter the missionaries who come to harass the Muslims in their own homes. The IPCI published 100,000 copies of this manual, Combat Kit, for free distribution worldwide. This manual is a book of instructions and is not intended for your entertainment. As soon as you get it in your hands, browse through the index on page 1 and follow the instructions as contained on page 2. To start the exercise, you need the Bible. If you do not have one, then buy one in the language of your choice, preferably the King James Version, KJV. I make my students open the inside front cover of the Bible in their hand and make them glue their copy of the combat kit for permanency into the Bible. Otherwise, the manual is apt to be misplaced or get lost. Once combat kit is stuck in the place, the student is now prepared for the first move. He or she is asked to open the index on page 1 of the manual. Scanning the topics, our eyes rest on item 16, that is, incest, types and types of incest in the Bible. Page 13. End of chapter 2. Start of chapter 3. The Bible, an anthology on incest. A kind reminder that the link to the combat kit is in the description below. The reader is naturally shocked to find such a heading in a book attributed to God. One has to read it to believe it. Quickly, the reader refers to page 13 to savor the spiciest part of combat kit. First, at the head of the page is the definition from the New Collins Dictionary. Incest. Sexual intercourse between two persons who are too closely related. The Oxford Dictionary adds the words to marry. Whilst in the middle of this research, I was visited by two Bible peddlers on a Sunday morning at home. They came to give me solutions to the problems of the world from the Holy Bible. 
I changed the subject, and I suggested to them that I was on the verge of writing an anthology on incest. I asked whether they knew the meaning of the word incest. They said that they knew. I explained the meaning to them. It was about having sexual intercourse between father and daughters, between son and mother, between father-in-law and daughter-in-law, between brother and sister. I asked them, what would they say if, on completion of my essay on the subject, I presented it to their teenager sister or daughter to read? They both replied to the effect that they would strangle me. I asked why. They said that that act of my giving a filthy, dirty, immoral book to their loved ones was an attack on their chastity. I said, I would not blame them for their strong reaction. But what if the obscene, immoral treatise on incest was derived from your so-called Book of God, the Holy Bible? Impossible, they exclaimed indignantly. The Bible contains no such pornography. Prove it, they demanded. I asked, the volume you are holding in your hands, is it the Bible? The Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers always carry one under their arm. Yes, was the answer. Can I have a look? It was handed to me. I opened it to Genesis chapter 19 and pointing to verse 30. I asked one of them to read. The Bible peddler scanned the verses and smelt the rat. He wanted to change the subject. I asked, What's wrong? Is that not the word of God? Yes, they blurted. But, but, but when persuaded, what did the Christian read? See pages 14 and 15 for the actual reproduction from the Holy of Holies. Both the reproductions are from the King James Version. You will observe that there are slight variations between them. In verse 32, the first version speaks of the daughters of Lot wanting to preserve seed of our father, whereas the second records as preserve lineage of our father. But the more modern translations of the Bible calls a spade a spade. They do not mince matters. That night they, both the daughters of Lot, gave him their father Lot wine to drink, and the older daughter had intercourse with him. The next day the older daughter said to her sister, I slept with him last night. Now let's get him drunk again tonight, and you sleep with him. Then each of us will have a child by our father. So that night they got him drunk, and the younger daughter had intercourse with him. In this way, both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. Holy Bible, Genesis, Chapter 19 verses 33 to 35, from the Good News Bible in today's English. As a result of this illicit, incestuous relationship, both of the daughters of Lot delivered a son each who became famous in the Bible as the progenitors of the Ammonites and the Moabites, specially guarded and protected communities in the Book of God. The Jews were to exterminate the Palestinians, nothing that breeds was to be spared. But for Lord's children of bastardy, God had a special soft spot. That the Lord spoke to me, Moses, saying, This day you, the Israelites, are to cross over at Ur, the boundary of Moab, the Moabites. And when you come near the people of Ammon, the Ammonites, do not harass them or meddle with them. For I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession because I have given it to the descendants of Lot for a possession. Holy Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter 2, verse 19. The Ammonites and the Moabites were not one whit better than their polytheistic Palestinian cousins. Their only redeeming grace in the sight of the biblical God was that they were the seed of Lot, an incestuous breed. Ask your Bible temper, what is the moral? the lesson to be learned from this shameless lewd story. If there is no moral and there is none, then why did God not reproach Lot or strike him with syphilis, gonorrhea or AIDS? But instead, his offsprings were a blessed race in God's sight. How immorally moral or morally immoral can you get? 
psychologist confirms. Dr. Vernon Jones, an American psychologist of great repute, carried out experiments on groups of school children of equal age and educational status. Certain stories with particular bias were told to the children. His conclusions were that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in the character of these children, even in the narrow classroom situation. Little wonder that the mighty evangelist Jimmy Swaggart, in his book on incest, bewails that incest between fathers and their daughters have reached endemic proportion in the mighty United States of America. There is a law at work. Physically, you are what you eat, and morally and mentally, you are what you read. Before proceeding further, open your Bible at Genesis chapter 19 at verses 30 to 36 and write across the top on two pages in big, bold handwriting, incest between father and daughters, and underline it. At the bottom of these very two pages, write in equally bold types the next reference on the topic, incest between mother and son. Find the next reference in your own Bible. Genesis chapter 35, verse 32. Having opened Genesis 35, frame verse 22 and write as a heading across the two pages in bold, incest between son and mother, and underline. At the bottom of the set pages, write incest between father-in-law and daughter-in-law. Find Genesis chapter 38, verses 15 to 18, and repeat the exercise of supplying the page number and framing the verses as you had done in the previous two examples. And get back to your combat kit, pages 13 and 14, and complete the exercise of marking your Bible to confront every Christian crusader who knocks on your door. The better your preparation, the swifter will be the flight of the Bible peddler. Glance once more at the previous two pages, 18 and 19, and their heading, Incest between son and his mother. Read verse 22 there. Both the reproductions are from the most renowned King James Version. The larger types are from the KJV in its fifth major revision, after revising the book five times over. The Christians still call it the King James Version. Compare the two reproductions of this one verse 22. They begin, and it came to pass, and, and so it happened. The Christians have not yet freed themselves from the once upon a time syndrome. Modern translations, more explicit. Both the quotations speak of Reuben went and lay with Bilha. The Roman Catholic's Dewey version differs in its choice of words. It says, Reuben went and slept with Bala. They meant Bilha. Now these variant readings do not tell us how old Reuben was. No one would raise eyebrows if a five-year-old or ten-year-old kid sleeps with his mother or his stepmother to keep himself warm. The New Century Version, in its International Children's Bible, published by Word Bibles of Word UK Limited, Milton Keynes, England, does not want Christian children to fumble over the meaning of lay or slept. They even got their Bible thumpers out of their misery of explaining away simple words lending themselves to dubious interpretations. Their rendering is, Reuben had sexual relations with Israel's slave woman Bilha. Could they have spelt it out in any simpler form for the born against, who will never grow up? Of the twelve sons of Jacob, Reuben was the firstborn, the eldest son, who in the prime of his life raped his mother. Call a slave woman or concubine, she was his father's wife, and your father's wife is one's mother by any definition. Wife and concubine are synonymous terms in the Bible. Check it out in your own Bible at home. A. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. Holy Bible, Genesis chapter 25, verse 1. Genesis is reputed to be the first book of Moses, alayhi salam, 
God Almighty himself is supposed to have dictated the five books of the Jewish Torah, now accepted by all Christians as God's word. In the first of these five books, God Almighty spells it out for Moses that the third wife of his friend, Abraham salam, was Keturah, the previous two being Sarah and Hagar. If the Lord God of Moses himself acknowledges Keturah as Abraham's wife, then who can have the audacity to contradict him and denigrate Keturah? But some unknown anonymous writer of the first book of Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 32, had the nerve to change God's word dictated to Moses from wife to concubine, unless they mean the same thing. Otherwise, the Bible Tamper will have to acknowledge that there is yet another contradiction in his Bible. Look in the index of your combat kit for contradictions in the Bible and add this item also to your list. Reverting to the subject marked at the bottom on pages 18 and 19, that is incest between father-in-law and daughter-in-law, after having completed the exercise as instructed on page 17, that of framing verses 15 to 18 of Genesis chapter 38, this chapter 38 is very effective also in proving that Bible is not the word of God. End of chapter 3 A kind reminder that the link to the combat kit is in the description below. Start of chapter 4 Test of Inspiration Christian missionaries are very fond of repeating the following verse from the writings of St. Paul. St. Paul happens to be the most prolific of all authors of the Christian Bible. He has authored more than 50% of the books and epistles of the New Testament, to be exact, 14 out of the 27. In his self-professed inspiration, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is Paul's second personal letter to his protege, Timothy. Do you remember Paul advising Timothy in his first epistle? Drink no longer water, but choose a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 23 Now Paul is giving Timothy a more sanguine, spirited advice, adaptable for a wider audience. But who is this Timothy? He is a recruit to help Paul in his self-appointed mission. He is the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother which makes him a Jew according to Jewish law, but he was an uncircumcised Jew. To make him kosher, Paul had to have Timothy circumcised. Acts chapter 16 verse 3 In the verses under consideration, Paul advises Timothy on the subject of scripture. The scripture Paul is referring to is not the ones which later on became known as the gospel according to St. Matthew or the Gospel according to St. Mark, or the Gospel according to St. Luke, or the Gospel according to St. John. All these writings had not yet seen the light of the day. They were to follow many decades and centuries later. Paul had no inkling about them. He was referring Timothy to the Holy Scriptures with which he had been familiar from his childhood. The books of the Jews as contained in the Old Testament confirm this from verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Since verse 16 under discussion is widely used by the Christian missionaries to prove the validity of the Holy Bible, we will use it for a test case. The verse implies that if any scripture originates from God, it will prove profitable for 1. Doctrine, teaching, 2. Reproof for convicting, rebuking, for showing people what is wrong in their lives. 3. Correction, useful for correcting faults. 4. Instruction unto righteousness, 
for training and teaching us how to live correctly. I find the above four headings to categorize God's words to be very reasonable. I have been asking the Christians whether they can find a fifth heading under which the word of God can be rubricated, and in all my experience, I have not had another befitting headline. We will leave it at that. Now let us revert to that famous chapter 38 of Genesis for analysis. It is worth perusing the whole chapter so that no missionary can ever accuse you of reading his Bible out of context. What is the context? The first five verses speak about Judah and his three siblings. Judah is the father of the Jewish race from whom he derived the words Judea and Judaism. Also Judah, Hebrew Huda, also Arabic. Huda to Hudi, Yahudi, meaning Jew. Of his three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah, he gets his firstborn Ur married to a woman named Tamar. But verse 7 records his untimely demise. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked. Ur erred in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 7. According to the standard laid down in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, to test the scripture whether it is from God, we ask our missionary friend, under which heading will you put this verse? Under 1, doctrine, 2, reproof, 3, correction, or 4, instruction unto righteousness. Our friend will not find it difficult to give the correct answer. Reproof. In effect, we learn that if we do anything wicked in the sight of God, He will destroy us. That is the moral. That is the lesson. In verse 8 of chapter 38 of Genesis, we are told that the old man Judah tells his second son Onan to go in unto his late brother's widow and beget a child from her so as to carry on the name of his deceased brother, as he had died childless. The Jews were specially particular that one's name should not perish. The Bible records, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, meaning have intercourse with her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, that the child would not be carrying his name. And it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he, the Lord, slew him also. Holy Bible Genesis chapter 38 verses 8 to 10 God killed Onan for his selfish envy. He did not want his deceased brother's name to carry on as was required by the Mosaic law. Ask your Bible thumper under which of the four headings will he put this instant retribution of God? Under doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction unto righteousness? Reproof, again, is his answer. The problem did not tax his brain. I hope that you have already framed the verse 15 to 18 as instructed. This short chapter, Genesis 38, is the choicest and spiciest piece of pornography in a book of God. Make a point of reading it a few times. Judah sends his daughter-in-law Tamar to her father's house with the promise that when his third son Shaleh was big enough to consummate the marriage, he would recall her for him to fulfill his obligation to give her a baby to perpetuate the name of her deceased husband, Ur. Judah was a superstitious person. He had reasoned that he had lost two sons already through this witch, Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and he was not prepared to risk the life of his only remaining son, Shelah, fearing lest pre-adventure he die also, as his brethren did. Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 11. Shelah is grown, and perhaps already married, but the old man is not recalling Tamar to enable her to conceive a child in the name of her late husband. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. 
She wanted to avenge Judah's dereliction of duty. She gets the news that her father-in-law was going to Timnath to shear his sheep. She planned to waylay him. She went and sat by the wayside, knowing in her heart of heart that the old man will never pass her by without making a pass. True to tradition, Judah saw her and supposing her to be a harlot, a prostitute, a whore, he proposed to her. Come too, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee, for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 16. People did not carry ready cash or credit cards with them in those days. So he said that he would send her a goat kid from his flock after he had had sexual intercourse with her. Tamar was not one to be taken in by such glib talk. She had a master plan, well thought out and scientifically executed. She bargains, what guarantee is there for me that the goat kid would be sent? What guarantee do you want? asks Judah. Your ring, your bracelets. People used to wear bangles on their wrists those days, and the rod that you are carrying in your hand. The old man handed the things requested, and cohabited with his daughter-in-law. With this single copulation she conceived, not forgetting that both her and Onan had singularly failed to impregnate Tamar. Within three months the pregnancy became apparent. Tongues began to wag. The news reached Judah that Tamar had played the harlot and was with child by Hodem. His righteous indignation knew no bounds. He ordered, Bring her forth, the bitch, and let her be burnt. Before this, she was a witch. He had lost two sons on account of her. Now she is a bitch and deserves to be burnt alive. Tamar was more willy than Judah could imagine. Before she could be confronted by her father-in-law, she sent forth the ring, the bracelets, and the staff, with a servant and a plea beseeching him to find out the culprit responsible for her pregnancy. She said, By the man whose these things are am I with child. Judah acknowledged his belongings and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my surviving son, and he knew her again no more. Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 26. Nine months after the sexual encounter on the Timnath road, between Judah the father-in-law and Tamar his daughter-in-law, the midwife was on the alert by Tamar's bedside. From the size of her abdomen, she had surmised that twins were in her womb, and according to the laws of Moses, she had to be particularly careful to label the firstborn. If the woman delivered identical twins and if care was not taken to mark the first one to see the light of day, then grave injustice was feared. Because the firstborn was to receive the lion's share of his father's patrimony. While Tamar travailed, the one put out his hand through his mother's womb and the nurse tied a scarlet thread quickly to signify that this one came out first. But this was too sensitive for the tiny trot. So he quickly withdrew his hand into the warmth of his mother. And behold, his brother came out and the midwife exclaimed, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Zira. Holy Bible, Genesis chapter 38, verses 29 and 30. The race stands for one who has jumped the queue, one who has done others out of their turn, and Zira means red in Hebrew because he had the scarlet thread on his hand. The recurring question is, what is the moral of this biblical sexology in this famous chapter 38 of the first book of the Bible? God killed Ur, the lesson we learned was reproof. God killed Onan, the lesson again was reproof. Now Judah commits incest with Tamar and begets bastard twins who are honored to become the great-grandfathers of the only begotten Son of God. 
What is the moral? No moral. So it is immoral. Under what heading will you now put this filthy lewd story of a daughter-in-law entrapping her not too innocent father-in-law? Is it, number one, your doctrine, two, your reproof, three, your correction, or four, your instruction unto righteousness? Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. If we cannot tabulate this filth under any of the four headings to serve some purpose in a book of God, then we would be forced to invent a fifth heading. The fifth heading stares us in the face. It is pornography. Judah, the father of the Jewish race from whom we derive the word Jew, Judaism, Judea, etc., and his daughter-in-law Tamar, and their illicit offsprings, Perez and Zira are immortalized in the so-called Book of God for their bastardy. The Book of the Genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brethren, and Judah begot Perez and Zirah of Tamar. Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In every Bible that provides a cross-reference, where the words, and Judah begot Perez and Zirah of Tamar occur, the marginal note points to Genesis chapter 38, and that lewd chapter with its raunchy details. Onan also has made his mark in the Hall of Fame, Hall of Infamy. Every reputable dictionary enshrines his envious sexual perversion under the heading Onanism, the sin of Onan. Coitus Interruptus, derived from Onan, son of Judah. Genesis chapter 38, verse 9. Son of God or Son of Holy Ghost The Christians, in their overweening zeal to produce a genealogy for their Lord and Master Jesus, have invented two genealogies, one by St. Matthew and the other by St. Luke. Between these two lists of the ancestors of Jesus, they gave him 66 fathers and grandfathers. Of these lists, no two names are identical, except Joseph the carpenter, who can in no way be called the father of Jesus Christ, because Matthew tells us, Before they, Joseph the carpenter and Mary came together as husband and wife, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Ghost. Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Matthew, within three verses, confirms twice that it was the Holy Ghost who impregnated Mary. By definition, we know that in every language of the world, the one who is responsible for impregnating a woman is the actual father and not the putative supposed father. Hence, according to the unequivocal statement of Matthew, the Holy Ghost is the actual father of Jesus and not God Almighty. The Christian world should review their theology by calling their God Jesus the Son of the Holy Ghost and not the Son of God. End of chapter 4 a kind reminder that the link to the combat kit is in the description below. Start of chapter 5 Pornography Every reference is from the Holy Bible. 1. Sex between a father and his two daughters. Night after night, both the daughters of the prophet Lot seduced their drunken father and conceived children from him. Genesis, chapter 19, verses 30 to 36. 2. Son cohabits with his mother. Reuben, the eldest son of Jacob, in the absence of his father, had sexual intercourse with his father's wife and Israel. Another name for Jacob heard it. This episode was reported to him, but he did not fume or spank his son for his naughty behavior nor did God have a single word of reproach for him. Genesis, 
chapter 35, verse 22. 3. Judah commits incest with his daughter-in-law. She conceives immediately and delivers bastardly twins who become the grandfathers of Jesus Christ. Thus God rewards Judah and his progeny. Genesis chapter 38 verses 15 to 30. 4. Amnon, one of the sons of the prophet David, rapes his sister. A worthy son of a worthy father, according to the Holy Bible. Amnon, by a masterful stratagem, rapes his sister Tamar, and God did not punish or reprimand him. 2 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 5 to 14. 5. Another son of David, the man according to God's own heart, rapes his mother, ten in a row, wholesale. Absalom sets up a tent on the flat palace roof and lays ten of his father's wives and rapes them all one by one in the sight of the whole of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 16 verses 21 to 23 6. Jerusalem, the Jews, the insatiable whore. Neither the Assyrians, the Babylonians, nor the Egyptians great or flesh, could ever satiate the Jewish whore. Other prostitutes were paid by their clients for their services, but this one paid them for being serviced. She sped out her legs to every passerby. Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 23 to 34. 7. The two sisters competing with one another in their harlotry. For she doted upon her paramours, her lovers, whose flesh, genital organs, was as the flesh, genital organs, of donkeys, and whose emission is like the emission of horses. Ezekiel, chapter 23, verses 1 to 35. If these little snippets do not satisfy you, then open these other chapters and verses in your Bible at home. Do not forget to highlight them in red for easier reference. A. She seizes him and kisses him. Come, let us take our fill of love till the morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. Proverbs, chapter 7, verses 7 to 22. B. Says the woman, my king was lying on his couch. My lover has the scent of myrrh as he lies upon my breasts. C. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. When I found him, I helped him, and would not let him go, until I had brought him into my mother's house to the room where I was born. Song of Songs, Chapter 3, Verses 1 to 4. D. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your two breasts are like fawns. Your rounded thighs are like jewels. I say, I will go up the palm tree. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of vine. Song of Songs, Chapter 4, Verses 1 to 7. E. And Samson went to Gaza. And there he saw a harlot, a whore, a hooker, a prostitute, and he went in unto her, had sexual intercourse with her. Judges, chapter 16, verse 1. George Bernard Shaw, the great British thinker and playwright, remarked on perusing the Holy Bible that it is the most dangerous book on earth. Keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it and the Plain Truth magazine, a Christian publication of the World Church of Tomorrow, in one of its articles on the Bible had this to say, many a censor would give the Bible an X rating. To those of you who wish to make a thorough study of the Christian Bible, it is strongly recommended that you master the combat kit, which is your lethal weapon against Bible thumpers. End of part one.
End of chapter 5.